Hello everyone, this is Brad Wistens. This video is going to be a single stage space plane challenge where I'm going to try to go to both the surfaces of Lathe and Tylo and return unrefilled. About a year and a half ago, I, along with a lot of other people, considered the challenge of going to the surface of Tylo and back on a single stage unrefilled to be impossible. And I had the idea of making a video where I would attempt it, see how far I could get, and demonstrate why it was impossible. But with the new Wolfhound engine from the DLC, I actually ended up succeeding, but not too long afterwards the Wolfhound was nerfed. A common question since then has been if the mission is still possible with the nerf to the Making History engines. My idea with this mission was to make up for the margin lost through the engine nerf by using part clipping to reduce aerodynamic drag. A takeoff mass of 48 tons per rapier engine means that this plane has a lot of trouble getting off the ground. In previous missions, I've coasted to the west side of the flats that the KSC sits on in order to give myself more room to pick up speed before takeoff. That's not going to cut it with this plane, so I'm actually going to taxi up to the top of the hills just west of these flats. I considered using a ground vehicle to push it up there, but I had enough margin that I decided to avoid any technicalities over what counts as a single stage and use the plane's own power to get up there. Fortunately, the impulse required to get up to the top of the hills is mostly refunded by coasting back down. With an eye on minimizing dry mass, I've also minimized the amount of wing area on this plane, and I need to get to about 150 meters per second for this really to fly properly. Flatter is better when it comes to making ascents efficient, so I'm going to stay at sea level until about 700 meters per second, before the angle of attack on the wings is going to make me climb. My next goal is to reach the highest speed possible on just the air breathing cycle of the rapier engines. Just in terms of thrust and drag, the best altitude to do this at would be at sea level. But heating at that level is going to render that impossible. We need to get to at least 15 kilometers in order for overheating to not be an issue. The problem with 15 kilometers is that the thrust of the rapier engines is dependent on the Mach speed we are traveling at. At these high Mach speeds, we are losing thrust as the Mach increases. At 15 kilometers, the speed of sound on Kerbin actually reaches a local minimum, so we're going to go to a higher altitude, about 18.5 kilometers, to try to reach our max speed on air breathing engines. Partly thanks to all the drag occlusion on this craft, I'm able to reach almost 1,700 meters per second at 18.5 kilometers. Unlike in the previous Tylo single stage mission, I'm not going to use any oxidizer to reach Kerbin orbit. After cutting out the rapier engines, 8 LVNs and 5 ion engines are going to get us the rest of the way to orbit. As I get closer to orbital speed, my centripetal acceleration is increasing, which means that I need less lift and therefore less drag from the wings in order to maintain level flight. The ion engines are using the electricity from the alternators on the LVNs, which means that when the LVN engines are cut, the ion engines are as well. At 68 kilometers, I burn some additional liquid fuel using the LVNs. This gets me closer to a circular orbit, and I now have some solar panels I can extend, which will let me use the ion engines to complete the circularization. My acceleration from the ion engines is around 1 30th of a meter per second squared, so I'm not doing a lot of the circularization with them, but this mission is all about improving margins and every little bit counts. The next step in this mission was to maneuver from a low Kerbin orbit into an elliptical Kerbin orbit. There's going to be three similar maneuvers in this mission, and as a result of the extremely low acceleration from the ion engines, this was the most time-consuming and the least fun-to-fly part of this mission. I'm considering some ways to automate this in the future, but I want to make sure my missions can still fairly be considered stock. I'd be curious to hear your input on that. My well-worn gravity assist path to Jewel is going to add a much more significant Mooner assist this time. This is normally something I don't bother with because it increases the planning significantly and the Delta V savings aren't that great, but the margins were so intense in this video that I was really intent on saving Delta V as much as possible. Since Bill was our pilot, we did put some extra planning in to make sure that our gravity assist to the moon gave us an extra close approach on the way through. The gravity assist off the moon is just enough to get us to EVE, which means that after slingshotting off EVE and back to Kerbin, 
we're going to slingshot to Eve once more, which will get us enough relative velocity to slingshot off of Kerbin the second time and get us the rest of the way to Joule. Normally the way I do corrections during a complex gravity assist maneuver is just to do extremely small corrections one or two maneuvers ahead. This results in correction burns that are fractions of one meter per second and essentially negligible. For some extra Keplerian recreation, I very carefully corrected my approach to Joule such that it would give me a gravity assist off of Tylo, which put me onto a resident orbit and then a second approach of Tylo, which would then put me onto approach of light. There was also a Val assist that managed to sneak its way in there. And all of this was done with no corrections after reaching the Joule system. One secondary benefit of the space plane approach is that the wings really help with aero braking on approaches like Lathe, and I'm able to reach just the elliptical orbit that I want. Thankfully, the atmosphere of Lathe means that I don't have to use the ion engines here, and I'm going to aero brake down to a low Lathe orbit. My target landing zone is going to be quite familiar here. I'm going to be landing on the mountainous island with the crater lake. Landing on the very top of the mountain is going to be quite a bit more important this time. The plane is still very heavy and is going to have a lot of trouble getting back off the ground on the takeoff run and being able to start from elevation is going to be absolutely necessary. This craft was very stable and controllable aerodynamically, but the need for precision was high. The minimized wing area means that my stall speed is quite high and in order to be able to land and stop as I reach the top of the mountain, I needed to be at the exact right speed at the right elevation on the approach. Next I actually have to stop this thing as I reach the top of the mountain. The brakes and KSP are nowhere near powerful enough to do this regardless of wheel friction. So I'm going to kick out the rear landing gear to help myself skid to a stop, kind of like what you do on a fixed gear bicycle without front brakes. As I brake to a stop, I just need to make sure that I'm close to perpendicular with the gradient of the slope so the brakes are actually strong enough to keep me in place. Since this is an unrefueled mission, there's no mining to do, so all we got to do is get out, put down a flag, and we're ready to take off. At this point in the mission, I was able to resolve some issues I was having with visual mods, so expect the clouds to make a return. I've waited until sunrise to start my takeoff. This will allow me to see what I'm doing during the takeoff run. And while solar power isn't that powerful out here, it will give me a little bit of solar power to help with circularization. My heading during the takeoff run is going to be significantly south of due east. There is a second ridge line on this island directly east of me that I need to miss, so we're going to go right around the southern end of it. I'm going to be doing as much coasting as possible during both landings in this mission because reaction engines have a specific impulse. That means that their specific power output is a linear function of how fast you're going, so coasting avoids using them when they're at their least efficient. At 100 meters per second, I fire up the rapiers on air breathing mode, and at about 120 meters per second, we hit the lip of the ridge and take off. This is not fast enough to maintain level flight, so I'm going to dive until we've reached about 150 meters per second. And fortunately, the terrain gives us just enough room to pick up the nose at this point and start flying for real. Once reaching the second ridge line to the east that I mentioned earlier, we're going to make a left turn to get our heading to due east, and then stay at sea level to pick up speed. At about 600 meters per second, I'm going to start climbing. I would have waited even longer, but there's a second island in front of us that we do need to miss. One detail about Lathe that I had really failed to take into account on previous missions is that there's a very dramatic local maximum of the speed of sound at 22 kilometers. Getting up to 22 kilometers before accelerating to my maximum velocity on the air breathing engines let me get to 1,775 meters per second. This is getting close to orbital speed, and as a result, almost all of the delta V from this ascent is from the air breathing cycle of the engines. The efficiency of this is why I was able to squeeze a lathe landing into this mission. The final part of the ascent to space here is significantly steeper than what you'd see on Kerbin. The upper layers of lathe's atmosphere are denser than you might expect, and there's still quite a lot of drag up there, and we wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. Once we're at our apoapsis, we're going to circularize with the LVN engines with a little bit of help from the ions. 
Once reaching low lath orbit, I have the longest portion of ion burns in the mission. I have to burn from a low lath orbit to an elliptical lath orbit. I then have a very small ejection burn that gets me from elliptical lath orbit to a rendezvous with Val, which gives me a slingshot that gives me an approach of Tylo. This Val assist does nothing to decrease the ejection delta V from lathe. Any ejection from lathe at the right orbit will get you onto an approach of Tylo. What this does do is it decreases my relative speed to Tylo once I get there, so I'm saving delta V on the injection burn into Tylo. This also dramatically decreases the burn necessary to capture in Tylo's orbit. The low amount of solar power out here means that anything other than a very small capture burn is going to be totally impractical. From elliptical Tylo orbit, I have an even longer set of maneuvers down to a low Tylo orbit. As with the lathe landing, my target landing zone on Tylo has been chosen very carefully. I wanted somewhere that was a very high elevation, reasonably close to the equator, and had an uphill to coast to a stop on, and a downhill to coast up to a takeoff on. I also needed a place that was reasonably smooth. The way surfaces are put together in this game, there's always a little bit of angular geometry going on, but I wanted to make sure there was no really rough edges. Adjusting the terrain detail settings is also going to do a ton to allow my landing gear to survive the terrain. My target landing spot for this mission is going to be pretty close to where I landed for my last Tylo single stage mission. In that mission I landed on top of a ridge line that overlooked a gorge which allowed for an easy takeoff. This time I'm going to be landing just to the north of there on top of the even higher altitude mountains. I've put my low Tylo orbit at 10,200 meters just at the elevation of my target landing zone. One orbit before the final descent, I'm dropping my periapsis significantly below this. Because the rest of the planet isn't this high in elevation, I'm still able to miss the surface, and that gets me a little closer to landing speed before I have to do the final descent. I've planned my Tylo landing and the takeoff as well to use as much of the LVN engines and as little oxidizer from the conventional rocket engines as possible. I did consider during the planning phase an approach which was all liquid fuel. This required quite a bit more dry mass of LVN engines, but the higher overall impulse actually ended up with comparable performance, but the oxidizer approach did edge it out. At 1,650 meters per second, I am descending quite dramatically, and I'm going to fire up the wolfhounds, which is going to start to pull me out of this descent. I'm going to be burning at around 38 degrees above retrograde for the descent. This will allow me to maintain a level descent as I'm slowing down below orbital speed. My early designs for this mission involved using the closed cycle mode on the rapier engines as our conventional rockets for Tylo. Very late in the design process, I switched to this design, which uses four wolfhounds in that role instead. This involves more dry mass. We already have the rapier engine, so those essentially have a dry mass of zero. But the higher impulse resulted in performance that was very slightly better than the rapier approach. Both of these approaches beat out the all LVN approach, but this design with the wolfhounds did edge them both out. I descend to about 9.6 kilometers before the thrust from the wolfhound engines pull me out of the dive. We're now going to have a slight climb to the final touchdown, which is going to be at about 10 kilometers. This slight ascent along with the convex landing surface is going to make it quite a bit gentler. From our touchdown spot, we have a coast up to the summit of this mountain where we're going to be taking off. Keeping this stable during the taxiing involved quite a bit of playing around with the friction and spring settings on the wheels. I was finally able to find something that more or less wanted to keep itself pointed in the right direction. As opposed to the lathe landing, we are taxiing in reverse rather than forward, and reverse is the direction that this was really designed to be stable in. It's a lot easier to keep it upright and prevent any wing strikes in this orientation. The huge difference in efficiency between closed cycle and open cycle mode of the rapier engine means that the penalty of not reaching the summit of this ridge is significantly higher here. And I was very careful to make sure I was all the way at the top of this mountain before hitting the top and hitting the brakes. As with the lathe landing, there's no refueling to worry about, so all we have to do on the surface is get Bill out and make sure we plant the obligatory flag before getting ready for the takeoff run. 
Getting this plane to take off from Tylo was a huge challenge, and finding this landing spot was a big part of what's going to make it possible. From the summit, I'm going to coast southward to pick up some speed, narrowly missing one of the new collision active obstacles on the surface. After picking up some speed, I use the wheel friction to turn my heading to east, which is going to send me on course for a massive clip. I'm pitching up the nose to 35 degrees, where I'm going to stay for most of the ascent. This pitch gives me a slow and steady climb at first, which increases as fuel drains and my TWR increases. At a horizontal surface speed of 1,140 meters per second and a vertical speed of 135 meters per second, I am out of oxidizer, and it's going to be the LVNs and the ion engines doing the rest of the work. I'm quite a ways from orbital speed, but this vertical speed will give me some more time to burn into a circular orbit. However, our banked vertical speed only gets us so far, and at a speed of just over 1300 meters per second and an altitude of 15 kilometers, our plane and fearless pilot Bill Kerman start to fall back to the surface. As we get closer to orbital speed, our vertical speed does start to increase again, and now we just have to hope that we can pull out of this dive before we have an unplanned reunion with Tylo. Our descent bottoms out around 1600 meters where we finally reach orbital speed. This gives Bill another chance to enjoy some nice close passes to the ground on the coast up to Apoapsis. Once we reach Apoapsis, we're going to use the remaining liquid fuel to circularize into a low Tylo orbit, and then we can begin the slow, steady process of burning out into an elliptical Tylo orbit. We will have some extra ion fuel left at the end, but not enough to add another landing, so we're going to head straight back to Kerbin and the Kerbal Space Center. Our first gravity slingshot after ejecting from Tylo is going to be off of Val, and none of our approaches so far have been thrilling enough, so Bill decided to make this one the closest one yet. The periapsis of our gravity assist put us right above the tallest mountain on Val, and this resulted in a final assist at a nice, safe altitude of about one meter. From here, an assist off of Lathe, and then an additional assist off of Tylo will eject me from the Joule system and put me back on course to Kerbin. Even with wings, aerobraking a craft of this mass directly from a transfer from Joule is not going to happen. So my first approach of Kerbin will give me a gravity assist onto a second approach, which will then slingshot me onto an EVE rendezvous, which will then give me a third and more manageable approach of Kerbin. My velocity relative to Kerbin is now low enough that I can aerobrake into a captured orbit without any use of the engines. From here, like in many of my previous videos, I'm going to aerobrake down into a low Kerbin orbit. One thing I'm going to do a little bit differently this time is I'm going to leave the inclination on my orbit. In the past, I've been in the habit of using a normal burn to put myself into an equatorial orbit. This time we're just going to approach the KSC from an inclination. This does require that I am careful with the timing of my descent such that by the time that I reach the low atmosphere on Kerbin, I'm actually near the Kerbal Space Center. My descent has me on course to hit the equator east of the Kerbal Space Center. So for my final landing approach, I'm going to say hi to the island runway before doing a tight high G left turn which is going to give me a westward approach of the KSC runway. My mass and my stall speed are quite a bit lower now, but still nowhere near enough to land this on top of the VIB, so we're going to settle for a runway landing and then a coast up to the doors of the administration building. And that's going to bring this mission to a close. I hope you've enjoyed this latest dive into what's possible on a single stage. Looking forward to other ideas on what to attempt on a single stage. One of the obvious ones is to try to make it to EVE and back, this time unrefueled on the surface of EVE. That still seems pretty distant, so if you've got other ideas of things to try that might be possible, drop them in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great day.